Good morning. Welcome to the Harvey Chayette Spring Forum. I'm Chris Gaffney. I'm the Executive Director of Parkinson's Support and Wellness. Our Spring Forum is our annual educational seminar, and we are able to present this year's forum again thanks to a generous grant from the Chayette family. We are deeply appreciative of their continuing support. I want to also thank the members of our program committee, a few of whom are here with me today, who work year-round to deliver all of our educational programs. Thanks to our staff and volunteers for their efforts to produce today's program. Our theme for this year's program is Choosing Wellness, Integrative Medicine as a Whole Health Approach. Today we have a full program focused on combining traditional medicine with evidence-based complementary therapies to reduce pain, stress, and illness. Our speakers will discuss therapies that enable us to face and manage pain, stress, and illness. A little housekeeping first, however. We are meeting uh, again this year in a virtual setting um, on the advice of our medical professionals, and we are hopeful that next year we will once again be able to meet you here in person at the lovely Manor House in Mason. Because of the size of our audience, you will not see each other or yourself on the screen as you may have gotten used to in virtual meetings in the past. Uh, but we, uh, we will be taking questions. We ask that uh, you place in the chat box, type in any questions that you may have of our presenters, and we will relay those questions to them. We will have short breaks between presentations and we encourage you to visit our exhibitor hall. Uh, it is a virtual one where you'll find many organizations that provide services specific to the Parkinson's community. We will show you a link and we would recommend that you open a new tab in your browser and uh, connect on that link to see the exhibitors in our hall. UC Health's integrative medicine is the first in this region to integrate a range of evidence-based services for patients, such as acupuncture, massage therapy, exercise, nutrition, mindfulness-based approaches, and lifestyle medicine, medicine with uh, consultations with physicians. The clinic's multidisciplinary team will provide evidence-based th therapies that focus on a healthy lifestyle. Our keynote speaker is Dr. Miladin Golovich. Dr. Golovich is the medical director for UC Health's Integrative Medicine, and he is a professor of family medicine and integrative medicine at the University of Cincinnati and co-chair of the UC Health Cancer Wellness Clinic. He is developing similar programs to serve neurological disorders and patients with chronic health conditions. Dr. Golovich has worked in the fields of immunogenics, genetics, excuse me, and molecular and cancer biology, contributing to the understanding of interaction between the environment and our genes. His clinical work focuses now on lifestyle-related chronic diseases. Uh, Dr. Golovich will give us an overview of the programs at the University of Cincinnati and uh, talk about integrative medicine as a strategy. Dr. Golovich. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining us this morning. And uh, I must say that uh, it's such a pleasure to give a lecture and there are humans in the room. Uh, so that, you know, we got used to just looking into that camera on, on our computers. Um, so thank you all of you for being here. That is a big stress reliever for, for a speaker. And, um, First of all, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chris, and the whole team at the Parkinson Support and Wellness for giving us the opportunity to share with you some of the ideas that, that we have, um, some of the work that we do. And I'm particularly excited to be with my colleagues here, uh, whom you will see later, um, Mrs. Tina, our yoga therapist, uh, Dr. Rostogi, and Dr. Walker who will uh, review for, for you the, the science behind some of the therapies that they use in their work and, and demonstrate practical things that you can actually practice uh, at your home alone. So 
when, when thinking about uh, this presentation, I thought about um, just mentioning, and, and I think Chris mentioned that very well, uh, there is just one medicine, yeah, and, and that's the evidence-based medicine. A number of years ago, um, the father of integrative health, uh, Dr. Andy Weil, uh, published a paper with some collaborators um, stating how uh, the center of our healthcare should be self-care, the things that with minimal instructions we all can do. And then if self-care is not sufficient, there is a number of therapists that will mobilize that inner healing capacity that we all have. And if that is not sufficient, so if you have your you know, lifestyle modifications and you work on a number of those traditional therapies that we'll be talking, then we should be um, using our modern molecular medicine, high-tech interventions. If you look at what is self-care, that's essentially um, developed into field of lifestyle medicine, variety of treatment, treatment modalities to activate that inner healing ability we call integrative medicine. Uh, it's a huge spectrum and I'll uh, show you in a moment. And then um, our molecular medicine, that's, that's what you see from your, your physicians, your neurologists, whoever you, uh, is taking care of you with modern uh, Western medicine. So clearly the, the concept is let's first form the basis, and then if that doesn't work, then we will go to the, to the high tech. Often we kind of start at the outer ring and then we go towards inner. So we'll be, we'll be focusing on that inner, inner two rings. This is the definition, what is integrative medicine? You probably heard the terms alternative, complementary, holistic, yeah? And over the years, it, it kind of gelled together under the term integrative medicine. And, and really the key is that partnership, that relationship between um, practitioners of different therapies and uh, patient at the center of that uh, interaction. Now, there are a variety of modalities, established medical systems, whether it's traditional Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine, Native American medicine, you name it, they have different components, different modalities, and, and that's all under that umbrella of integrative medicine. Now, if you look at those different systems, you will find that all of them kind of overlap in certain areas. And those are the areas of, you know, how do we relieve stress? Um, which kind of foods can we eat? And over the years, that component of those integrative therapies came around, um, the field called lifestyle medicine for the past you know 30 years or so and so this is the definition of lifestyle medicine it's the key is here that every physician does lifestyle medicine yeah there is no doctor or nurse practitioner whom you have seen who doesn't want you to eat healthy foods who doesn't want you to sleep well who who is not excited about telling you how to relieve your stress but that is not a primary modality of intervention. Yeah. In lifestyle medicine, the primary modality is type of foods that we eat, how do we relieve stress, what's the sleep, do we avoid toxic substances, and how we nurture the meaningful uh, social interactions. One can understand that some of those food as medicine, movement as medicine, meditation as medicine can be used to prevent and avoid the disease. However, data are growing that you can arrest the progression of disease and in some cases even reverse chronic illness. I don't have a pointer here so I cannot show here, but you can see that there are like six main areas of your self-care. From food choices, physical activity, stress relief, social interaction, sleep, and avoiding toxins. And all of those have pretty established common pathways, how they impact our health. And some of those will we'll touch upon uh, how it relates to Parkinson's disease and in turn to other chronic conditions. So 
The biggest challenge here is, yes, we all know that, you know, there are certain foods that, that are healthy and that we should not be eating so-called junk food. Everybody knows what that is. Yeah, we actually gave it the name. We know that it's a good idea to practice some um, relaxation techniques. But often we would hear, well, I know it's good, but you know, I just don't feel like doing it. Oh, this doesn't work for me. That's too complicated. So what we'll try to show you today is that those are simple techniques. You can use them. And um, you have to make that first step to start practicing whatever excites you from that, from that wheel. These are the three key concepts, and I'll come to that at the end, um, how you can uh, implement some of those self-care practices. Uh, number one is experimentation. Yeah, it's, you just have to try different things because what resonates with me might not resonate with, with you. The second one is progress, not perfection. Just trying to focus on one small goal doing it consistently. And then when you feel confident, you can kind of add additional activity or expand it. And the third one is very, very important, and that's evaluation. Meaning, looking deeply, who is behind the recommendations? Is that professional medical society, or is that somebody who you know just came up with some idea and it's um, writing books about it? So evaluation, critical evaluation. And here is our phone number for our center um, and the website addresses where you can find more information. And as, as I'll go through the presentation, I will show you some of those uh, links. So um, Chris has mentioned interaction, genes and environment. And I think this is at the crux of, of our health and the disease. So these two uh, photos from Time magazine uh, indicate that was from 2003 when it was 50th anniversary of discovering the nature of our genes DNA. And then in 2000, there was a report, large international effort, multi, you know, multiple institutions, billions of dollars, and we finally sequenced the genome, all the genes of, of a human being. And there was a big hope that now when we know the genes, we'll be kind of saying, okay, yeah, this is the gene that is defective, we'll kind of fix it, we'll fix that. Turns out it was much more complicated. Number one, that wasn't complete sequence. Only recently, finally, all the gaps were completed. So now we can say in 2022, this was April 1 in, in Science Magazine, we finally really know 100% of, of what we are, all the sequences. Yeah? And when it comes to lifestyle, it turns out that it's not just the gene that you have, but how that gene is modulated and activated. And diet plays a big role. This is from um, UC Davis um, Center for Nutritional Genomics, showing how there are different pathways through which uh, certain foods, certain nutrients uh, impact um, the gene expression. But then we quickly realized that physical activity also does that. And our emotions and our thoughts also influence gene expression. And then another <laughs> layer of complexity is that circadian rhythm exposure to day and night, uh, use of those LCD screens, um, quality of sleep that might be impaired. And it turns out that about 10% of all the genes that we have are regulated by these circadian rhythm, rhythm, day and night cycles. Yeah? And we have disrupted this uh, profoundly. So, and then fairly quickly, it, it turned out that lifestyle, the practices that we do, from food to, to how we manage stress and physical activity, impacts the, the expression of those genes. And there are like switches, and those self-care modalities uh, profoundly impact which switch will be turned on to which degree which one will be turned off and this is just um, from popular press you probably have seen that um, how complex those interactions are 
And then if that wasn't enough, <laughs> turns out that we are mostly uh, microbes. We have um, more uh, microbial cells than we have our own cells. And it turns out that that adds another complexity that uh, what we have in our gut, what we have on our skin determines as well how our genes will work, how our bodies will work. So this is where we are. Uh, the challenge is not now just knowing the sequence, it's what do they mean, how do they are regulated. That is the biggest uh, adventure that we have. And, and in this cartoon said, I think I found a corner piece. That's where we are. So imagine three billion pieces puzzle. And you started, and we started, we found a corner piece, yeah? So, I'll switch now to Parkinson's um, with this introduction to understand, you know, how those uh, interactions occur and what we can do about, about those. And I use a couple of recent reviews that, that have um, um, really summarized uh, those concepts. So number one, uh, there are certain number of genes uh, that have been associated with risk of Parkinson's disease. And some of those I'll mention later, but there will be no quiz at the end. You don't need to worry about those names. And then we talked about this epigenetic, uh, those switches that turn on and off the genes. And then on the right side, you see environmental risk factors. Yeah. And there are a number of those, and we'll focus on those non-genetic factors will not really talk much about genes, but I just wanted to be aware that whatever we do here in our self-care has potential to impact those genes, impact the gut bacteria, impact the way uh, the gut communicates with brain. This was a recent review where they just looked at the hundreds of studies that examined non-genetic contribution to, um, to Parkinson's disease. And the summary is here. Um, the reference is at the bottom. If you want to go deeper, you can always go there. And uh, for the sake of time and just the review, I'll focus on, on conclusions. And whenever appropriate, I'll show you some piece of data that, that I, I think it's exciting that, that will um, engage you into trying some of those techniques. So what, after looking at all of those different factors, physical activity, coffee and tea are consistently associated with benefits. Um, this is uh, another meta-analysis just for bicycling. And you probably know about that. And, and you have certainly, many of you tried to do that. Um, this is just to enhance that knowledge that physical activity, and in this case, in form of cycling, has benefits. Uh, benefits are uh, for um, motoric symptoms and also for non-motoric, yeah? uh, quality of life. PDQ39, that's Parkinson's disease quality of life. If you look, if you ask questions and people who cycle, they, they report uh, much better um, different aspects of, of, of our quality of life. This review article is by my former colleague, I, I was at the Cleveland Clinic, and Jay Alberts um, was part of our wellness uh, uh, because of his interest in physical activity as it relates to health. And um, this is pretty a strong statement, universal prescription for Parkinson's disease, exercise. Yeah? And um, they very specifically state here in this review how we know that aerobic exercise has benefits, numerous benefits, especially for, for brain function and structure. And then what would be the prescription? What would be the intensity and duration that you would have to do? And they came up with three times per week, 30 to 40 minutes. And now, you know, 60 to 80% maximum heart rate. Yeah, nobody has a, you know, heart monitor and, and measures that and you can calculate and if you, go and, and do any uh, rehab, exercise rehab that we run at UC Health. They can determine that, they can test you. But um, one very useful thing, and they mentioned here, is to achieve intensity of, on the scale of the 
uh, how you estimate your exertion scale from 14 to 17. And, and you can see in the right upper corner, yeah, so this is this, you know, orange to, to red, yeah, 14 to 17. So it's kind of hard, yeah, it's not light, light activity to see the benefits uh, that they report. Another popular thing that you can do is tandem biking. So sometimes you cannot uh, have the speed and the frequency and, 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 and power to do this, but if you just almost like a passively pedal and somebody else is the one who is, who is moving the bike, you can still benefit. And um, this was one um, relatively small study because they, they were very comprehensive. And again, you can see here quite, quite intense, three times per week for, for 16 weeks profound improvements, uh, both in subjective and objective measurements. And one of those was increase in so-called brain-derived neurotropic factor, BDNF. So those individuals who achieved improvement, as you see here, it says VO2 max, which means you are more fit. You can use more oxygen per, per gram of tissue, more fit, more outcome and um, more um, results from exercise, you have higher brain derived neurotropic factor. Neurotrophic meaning growth, yeah? Um, and that is one of the factors that appears in the bloodstream and the concentrations in the bloodstream correlate with concentrations in the, in the brain. Now, what else um, happens uh, when you increase brain-derived neurotropic factor and many other ones. And that is shown here. <clears throat> this hippocampus is part of the brain that, that is involved into uh, you know, short-term memory. Those are those red dots on the, on the picture here. And you can see here hippocampal volume decreases as we age. However, it, it, it doesn't have to be that way. And the research shows that the more you are fit, the bigger your fitness is, this VO2 max, the higher volume in, in hippocampus you have. Yeah, so it's not just that you see the increase in molecules as a result of physical activity, but you see also the, the effect on the, on, the, on the brain itself. Yeah? What is exciting and how it shows how everything is interconnected is that practices such as yoga and Tai Chi and other mindfulness meditation practices can increase BDNF and, and many other things. They can impact uh, the gene expression. I'm just trying to kind of show you here how even if we focus on just one thing, there is this interconnection between what we do. And um, Tina will, will talk about, um, about yoga, and, and she mentioned some of those studies. The point here is we do not have large studies, and that's a challenge in the field. We have uh, a number of small studies, and, and they are randomized, and they are controlled. Um, they are short duration because those studies are expensive. But whenever you look and you put those together and you consistently find the same story, and that is story of benefit, improved uh, strength, improved balance, um, uh, reduced uh, motoric symptoms, um, better gait, and, and less risk of fall. Yeah, so those are those benefits. Um, now, we went from high intensity, then we came to, to yoga practice, and then this is the, the newest study that, that kind of I, I found very, very exciting. It was done in Thailand and it was a control study and it was uh, over a longer period of time. So what they want to do, they wanted uh, patients with Parkinson's disease to be active at their home because of pandemic. They said, okay, you don't have to go anywhere, what you can do at home. And so they would, they would walk like 10 meters, yeah, 30, 30 feet, back and forth and, and doing it mindfully for 30 minutes. And then after that, they would sit down and, and meditate for 30 minutes. Yeah, so it was combination of walking and, and meditation, yeah. And even when you do it with that intensity, that is not really high intensity. And, and 
you incorporate meditation, you can see the benefits. Yeah, they will, patients were adhering to it. They they were excited about it. They were doing it, and then they report on the on the questionnaires uh, specific for patients with Parkinson's disease how much uh, better they feel and how reduced anxiety they experienced. So yoga, uh, tai chi, qigong, uh, mindfulness meditation, any other kind of meditation has tremendous benefits um, that just you know go beyond that physical aspect or reduced anxiety. There is increased flexibility and, and increased awareness and um, Many of those practices incorporate uh, breathing techniques. And uh, you will see today um, some of these demonstrations that you can always have is the cheapest, always available stress relief tool. And here is the, the idea behind it. When our ancestors observed something that we have all seen, yeah? we breathe differently when we are excited and when we are in fear or when we are nice to relax we all know that yeah we hold our breath when we are tense yeah and when we are nice relaxed it's kind of deep easy breath so what our ancestors ask is can we change our breathing patterns so that we would change how we feel and the answer is yes that's the whole science in 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 all of those practices you can go into any traditional medical culture, and they will tell you how breath is important. And so we'll practice this today, and I will not go into the details. Uh, you'll just have to accept that there is good science behind it. Um, I show this slide often, uh, late Randy Glasberg, and uh, really you know, recognize what's happening is that sometimes we feel like it's 100%. It's just kind of putting uh, out of our ears the stress. So what we can do, clearly some of those techniques that I mentioned. And um, so Dr. Barbara Walker um, will be here. And I just put here the link oops, to, to her Mindful Mondays. Every Monday morning at 8.30, uh, she teaches Mindful Mondays. It's virtual. You click on it, and, and you join. Um, Meriden McGraw uh, does many uh, teachings. She teaches uh, for patients with neurological conditions. Some of you probably have seen her. I don't know why this is going automatically. Uh, and uh, so, so Meriden runs uh, the courses, and some of you probably um, have taken some of those. Then uh, we have here our Tai Chi and, and yoga therapist, uh, Jennifer. She teaches for patients with Parkinson's disease. Many of you probably have seen her. And, and Derek does the same. And then Tina and Josie uh, do yoga. And then we have uh, expressive therapist team, Dr. Rustogi, who will be uh, here today. And, and Betsy will not be here. But um, I'll just mention here that there is a very strong, solid body of evidence how music therapy can help patients with Parkinson's disease. And, and this is the reference for that. Um, this is our website. You can go and click on um, in, uh, classes and events. And when you do this, you will see the list of all those classes. And you can click here um, where it says register. And thanks to really generous support from the community, outputting support for what we do, we are able to provide those classes um, um, free of charge. Uh, many of those are recommended, but they are not covered by insurance. So it's a, it's a really bonus for our patients that they can use those modalities and learn and then practice on their own. Now, the, the next part of my talk um, is going to focus on foods. And um, when I uh, put this slide, I actually borrowed it from one of my colleagues. I found it really very insightful in the sense that outside of religion and sex, probably nothing is as personal as our food choices, maybe politics. 
And so what happens, often people come up with an idea, they grab it, and they write all these fictional books about which diet to eat and what to do. And there is absolute confusion. And, and what they really like is to focus on individual nutrients and make the whole universe out of how this particular one is the most important and how we should do everything. So I'll try to focus on a non-fiction part here. Again, there will be no quiz here, but um, I would also fail it, by the way. Um, but I wanted to highlight here some of the processes and all of those that are here that are believed to be the key molecular processes that happen in Parkinson's disease development and progression can be influenced by food choices, by diet. And clearly, one would need another symposium to kind of cover all of those. So I'll be fairly, fairly specific um, to explain that. Inflammation is a natural protective response, evolutionarily conserved. Without the inflammation response, we would not exist. Yeah. The problem is when that inflammation comes in, when there is injury, infection, or trauma, infection comes in, the injury is repaired, mm -hmm. and infection should, uh, the inflama inflammation comes up, uh, and it should go down once the, you know, the virus or the bacteria is cleared and the damage is repaired. Problem is that because of our toxic environment, our food choices, our unhealthy lifestyle, that inflammation doesn't go down where it should be. It always stays a little bit up. And that low level simmering inflammation, it's associated with a variety of chronic conditions. And Parkinson's in, uh, disease is in that other category. Yeah? There are too many to, to kind of list here. So I'll kind of. I was thinking where to put acupuncture, and it just fits beautifully here because many of these processes, especially neuroinflammation, is something that in traditional Chinese medicine uh, is considered as a very um, good target for, for intervention. So this is a map of meridians in the, in the acupuncture, uh, for acupuncture practices. And um, until very recently, we have seen the benefits, but again, this was small studies. And acupuncture can be used for a variety of chronic conditions. And Chris has mentioned, you know, pain and, and anxiety, etc. But you can see here, there is, a, and this is by the World Health Organization. So what is considered um, appropriate diagnosis to treat? Now, the, the problem is the insurance, medical insurance doesn't cover for all of those, but at least it covers for some chronic pain. Um, that many experienced. I put this here just to tell you how rapidly that field has, has advanced. Until very recently, when you would read paper about acupuncture, it would be in some, you know, integrative medicine journal. This paper here on the top left was published in Nature. Nature is a number one top-ranked biomedical journal. And when I saw this, I was texting our acupuncture group, and I said, have you seen this? This is unbelievable. Cutting-edge molecular science shows that there is profound benefit of acupuncture treatment. And there was even editorial down. It says, neurons that switch off inflammation, yeah? And those are activated by certain, when you insert needles in very specific points. Even if you go and do the experiments in, in, in rodents with acupuncture, now there is no placebo. You can demonstrate when you put needles in specific points, changes in the brain and changes in the gut, and it kind of brings all of those things together. Yeah, It's quite profound. So this is this other uh, paper done in, in Korea, published in um, uh, two years ago. So this is our acupuncture team. Derek, you have seen his face. He's also our Tai Chi teacher, and Sibyl and Angela, who are spectacular acupuncturists and, and very holistic uh, practitioners of traditional Chinese medicine. Speaking of pain, we are um, organizing a conference that will focus specifically on non-pharmacological approaches to uh, chronic pain management. 
and this will be on May 14 at Graduate uh, Hotel, and it will be in person. The information you can find down here at our uh, center's website. So, going back to inflammation, yeah, clearly there are many other modalities, but for the sake of time, we'll focus on, on nutrition. It has been shown beyond any doubt that fruits and vegetables and legumes are profound reducers of inflammation. And there is a number of studies. Um, this is just one that shows the higher intake you have. People who consume the highest amount have the lowest level of certain inflammation markers. In this case, they looked at C-reactive protein, CRP, which is a very non-specific marker, yeah? So it's not, you know, this is the marker that is the key for, you know, any particular illness. But in general, it tells you there is something going on in regard to inflammation. As it comes to Parkinson's uh, disease, there is a group of nutrients called polyphenols. There are like 4,000 of those. And they are in fruits and vegetables, and they are in those colored, colored uh, um, plant foods. And you can see here in the picture. And uh, there is a growing body of evidence how these polyphenols impact our quality of the gut composition. They also impact the oxidation state because that's believed to be one of the mechanisms and reduce the inflammation. Yeah, very powerful. Again, it's not one polyphenol out of these 4,000 as many supplements uh, kind of say, okay, we'll take this one out and pack it in the pill and you just take this and everything will be fine. It's the whole matrix, the whole composition. Yeah, the more diverse colors you have, uh, the better. We are failing miserably as a society. This has been the latest one um, update from the CDC. What's the uh, consumption of um, fruits and vegetables in the US? And you can see that we in Ohio uh, below 10% for the fruits and uh, below 8% um, for the vegetable. Three servings of vegetables, two servings of fruits. And that is the minimum. Yeah, this is not like the high end. That's where we want to be. So we have enormous room for improvement. Um, in fact, if you look at about 180 studies and you put them together into so-called meta-analysis as is done here in International Journal of Epidemiology, you find that we should be eating 10 servings of vegetables and fruits, maybe six, seven vegetables, three, four fruits. Yeah? And it's very easy to do this. You can see on the right side of the screen um, what is the serving, yeah, half a cup of beans or you know, a full cup of raw, raw green leafies or half a cup of you know, cooked broccoli, etc. This is so important because those type of foods are the food for our gut bacteria. They live from dietary fiber, undigestible carbohydrates. And the more diverse we are, the more diverse intake of fiber we have, the healthier gut microbiome we will have, the healthier we will be. I just want to tell you how impoverished we are with our gut microbiome. This was the study where they looked at fossilized poop from a uh, you know, thousand year ago or so or more uh, in the Southwest. And what they found is that about 40% of the diversity that they had at that time, we lost. We just don't have those bugs anymore in our gut. Yeah? And that's mostly because we, we eat a lot of processed refined foods rather than unrefined plant foods. And the gut in itself is very interesting in the sense that the best way to improve your gut health, your overall health is to eat fiber. And fiber is found only in plant foods, only in whole unrefined foods. And the changes in there impact how our brain functions. There is this constant interaction 
there are neurotransmitters produced in the gut that uh, eventually can end up in the brain. And people are trying to find that, that particular bacteria or particular combination of bacteria that will, you know, will say, okay, yeah, you know, here is, you can take this probiotic and, and now you'll be, you'll be fine. And there are many uh, studies that show that there are some benefits of particular, when you look at the genome uh, microbiome, and then you find some of these species that might be associated with reduced anxiety or maybe better motoric uh, control of symptoms. So it's a very exciting field. Uh, we are not there yet. By no means we know what's the, the most optimal way to, to do this. The one thing when, when I talk to people who study that, eat your uh, dietary fiber. That's the key. Um, and I will go very quickly here. We actually try uh, come to understand this was very recent study done because you go into societies that have very low uh, risk of developing Parkinson's disease. What's unique about them? They are here, as they said, this group from Israel, quasi vegan cultures. Yeah, most of them predominantly plant based. Yeah, and not only this, they found how because of that two key genes that play a role in parkinson's uh, development and progression can be positively impacted yeah clearly uh, much more needs to be done and if you randomize people in the mediterranean diet that is rich in plants vegetable fruits whole grains a lot of beans some fish some chicken turkey skinless breast you see the benefits. This was a study, a randomized study done in, in Iran, showing the benefits in variety of domains, yeah? especially for the, for the uh, brain health, cognitive health. Now, there is such a confusion about, you know, which diet to follow and, and so on. Um, US News and World Report ranks those diets every year. This is the ranking for 2022. Uh, you can access, you can, you can look at it and Mediterranean diet and DASH diet, and then below that will be my, mind diet, um, which is all of them are variations of Mediterranean diet, very rich in plant foods, whole, unrefined, unprocessed, consistently rank one or two or three in the top five, yeah? So when you kind of think, you know, what should I do? What should I eat? This is the safest thing to do. In contrast, People are spending taxpayers' money to study the diets that until now have been really uh, difficult to follow. Uh, you know, you need uh, supplements because they are so deficient in, in variety of things. And I'm just showing here a couple of those popular that are right at the bottom of, of the ranking from one to 40. So I'm not saying that in 20 years, uh, you know, modified keto will be, you know, number five but really you know you see this day and night difference in 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 the type and um, the quality and the health effects so this is by the american college of lifestyle medicine essentially let's move from this what we currently eat processed refined foods white bread white pasta to whole grain whole food plant-based eating diet how far you want to go on that spectrum it's really up to you yeah um, and that's what will, will help you. I put only one slide about supplements because I know people will ask about it. If there would be any particular effective supplement, your, your neurologist, your physicians will tell you about it. If there would be a solid science that, that experts agree that is beneficial. Again, when you read those papers, everybody's talking about natural compounds that are found in fruits and vegetables and beans and whole grains. So clearly the key is to eat those foods. There are two that I would encourage you to, to make sure that you take. One is omega-3 fatty acids, flaxseed, ground flaxseed, chia seeds, walnuts. Um, if you eat fish from fish, uh, fish oil, or you can take algae-derived um, long-chain icosapentaenoic and docosahexaenoic acid, EPA and DHA. And then everybody should take vitamin D, at least 2,000 units, and take it with food. It's a fat-soluble vitamin, and um, based on the current recommendations, if anybody has any uh, documented deficiency, clearly it needs to be corrected. Again, one nutrient is not going to 
be miraculous cure. I mentioned coffee and tea, and so this is, this is caffeine. It's uh, our modern society that is powered by caffeine. It's, it's a very uh, useful legal thing to do, to keep uh, sharp, and we have it here. Um, so, um, so what's so exciting about caffeine, uh, about coffee, yeah, not, not caffeine, coffee, yeah? Yeah, there is caffeine, but look at this at the bottom. It says polyphenols. Where did I mention polyphenols? When we were talking about fruits and vegetables, yeah, those berries. In American diet, coffee is the main source of polyphenols. Why? Because people don't eat a lot of vegetables and fruits, as I have shown you, and they drink a lot of coffee. Coffee is a wonderful, healthy drink. Try to uh, add healthy stuff into it. It's like salad. You can ruin it with salad dressings, yeah? The same thing you can ruin coffee with what you put in it. Um, so stay away from anything that has any sugar, that has any artificial flavors, colorings, etc. And um, I will wrap up here, focus on experimentation. I hope you'll be kind of excited about some of those things to try. Go slowly, step by step, build it up. You cannot jump from here to here overnight. And, and again, evaluate, including everything what I said. Oh, he's imagining this. I have read that you know, it's a good idea to, to do this. So please do that. And um, for physical activity, don't stress much. Sit less, move more. Any activity is good. The more you're active, the more benefits. You'll be able to do this, and Tina will show you how you can get there. Uh, I'm just kidding. It's not going to be that way. Uh, but you have to have a goal, you know. What will I do when I'll be 95? Uh, general guidelines for exercise, common sense. Don't do it after you have eaten. You know, be mindful of how you feel. If you're not feeling well, don't do it. I listen to your body. I mean, you know your body. Yeah. So when we'll be doing those exercises, you say, okay, you know, this doesn't make sense for me, so I'll skip that one. Yeah. Um, this is very common when you start practicing meditation, any of those techniques, because you'll feel anxious. In our culture, we feel guilty that we are doing nothing, so to speak. Yeah. So again, you have to overcome that, and it happens with the practice. So eat food, not too much, mostly plants, as Michael Pollan said. Avoid those processed foods and the industry is making sure that, that you know, there is larger and larger number of, of those products and it's increasing rather than decreasing. I hope you will change that after my lecture. I don't care what the doctor said, refined people don't eat unrefined foods. So eat unrefined foods. Uh, don't chew like these guys, 72 hot dogs in 10 minutes, world champion. Um, First of all, you don't want the processed, food, processed meats and you don't want to eat that way. Even if you eat green leafy vegetables, don't chew like this gentleman. Two and a half pounds, 17 and a half seconds, okay? Or don't be pope. Yeah, spinach, yes, but not, not the way. This is summary of, you know, what you can do. Chew well, chew well, chew well. Remember that whenever possible, do it and cook more, order less. This is the website where you can go. My former colleagues and dear friends, Dr. Mike Rosen and Chef Jim Perko have like 80 plus videos um, with certain recipes. You can do that. Dr. Annie Fan, who we had privilege to, to have her here last year, she has Brain Health Kitchen. She's a physician, also trained chef. A lot of information that you can find how to improve the health of your brain. And Dr. Melinda Ring from Northwestern has a wonderful TED talk which you'll enjoy. And remember, eat plants, keep moving, sleep well, be present, stay calm, and, and love people. And I will stop here. I'm so grateful for this opportunity. And um, we'll be um, taking questions. Am I live? Maureen, you're on, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. We have one that came in about um, the polyphenols. Uh -huh. Are those are those equal to antioxidants? Does that mean the same thing? Yes. So uh, polyphenols have many different functions in the cell. Some of them antioxidants. And if you, for example, look, if you take a cup of kale and you said, you know, 
which antioxidants are there and you see there is vitamin C, vitamin E, but then you blend it and you put it in a test tube and you measure the total antioxidant activity, you will find that it has like not 10 units of vitamin E, but 800 units of vitamin E equivalent, yeah? So antioxidant is one. Anti-inflammatory is another one. Uh, the third function is the detoxification function. If you have uh, liver cells and you look at certain enzymes that detoxify um, uh, compounds from our bodies, those polyphenols activate us. Yeah, and there are like 4,000 of them. They are in different categories. And they are not just, you know, in green leafy vegetables and fruits. They are in legumes. Soybeans have, you know, a lot of those, those uh, phytonutrients that are very, very similar. Yeah. A lot of primary physicians recommend CoQ10 mm -hmm. for cardiac benefit. Mm -hmm. But there was a big study years ago that CoQ10 did not benefit Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. As a practitioner, I still get a lot of questions about that. Should they take it? Should they not? In your recommendations of supplements, you recommended vitamin D and, and the and, fish oils. Uh, omega-3 fatty acids, yeah. whether from algae or fish oil, or depending what your diet is. Yeah. In, in, that, in that review, it's, it's a very nice review about supplements as it relates to Parkinson's disease. You know, there are a lot of studies and, and people are making PhD thesis and, and working on this. And I'm not saying that down the road we will not have good data and, and you know, looking back, they'll say, well, you said, you know, that's not such a great idea, but now it is, yeah? So science is always developing and we have to be flexible and mindful. But um, just very difficult to understand why would just one of this uh, nutrient make such a big difference. Now, there is big genetic difference between us. It's not harmful try it test it if you see that works for you go for it don't don't stress about it don't worry about mechanisms do we understand do we you know or, or not if it helps you often you start like this and i see patients coming with two bags and then it's like you know which one is helping you don't know is it safe is it is it you know wise to spend 300 dollars on on monthly supply of those compounds that are isolated from the from the foods that we could be consuming now if you are uh, taking uh, cholesterol lowering medications of certain categories there are some suggestions that taking you know 300 milligrams uh, coq10 might be helpful yeah again um yeah, I, I would leave this to individual but i would not focus on taking peel peel, peel from that that you can find in foods so along that same lines, when you talk about the self-care with experimentation, how do you experiment? You know, how long do you give something? Mm -hmm. what, what kind of evaluation tools are out there to mm -hmm. help you make a decision about that? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a good question. So when, when I mention experimentation, what I'm meaning here is, let's say you never, um, you were, you, you try to meditate, but you said, you know, I, I couldn't do it. My mind was too active and, and so on. And you kind of put this aside. Now you will hear, hear from our experts how valuable that practice is. And so you might say, okay, I will hear this one, this method, and this one. And this one has music in the background. This one has silence. This one has male voice. This one has female voice. That's what I'm talking about experimentation. Find the one that resonates with you, that's this period of experimentation, yeah? And you said, wow, you know, that's the one. And, and often it's almost like music, you know, I like this one, I don't like that one. And then you practice. You start doing this on a regular basis. Experimentation with foods, yeah? Maybe you, you know, don't like sweet potato, but suddenly you found on these websites that there is a good recipe for sweet potato hummus. Okay. What about ground flax seeds? Yeah, okay, I have high blood pressure. Ground flax seeds are pretty good at lowering blood pressure, so maybe I will experiment with that. That is that. Uh, so you try to, to see, you know, three weeks, four weeks. Some people think that that's what is needed to change your taste buds to train them sometimes things aren't pleasant and you said okay you know, this coffee is not anymore that tasty without that creamer 
kind of doesn't feel right. But let me kind of expose my taste buds for maybe two, three weeks and see uh, whether they get adapted. Yeah, that's that's that experimentation. That's what I had in mind. I think along along with those lines too in in the medication issues that we run into, you know, we only make one change at a time. Mm -hmm. And if somebody wants to embrace the Mediterranean diet, I think it's hard to go full force, right? So Absolutely. I think it's easier if you take maybe one step at a time, mm -hmm. you know, maybe three days a week, you'll start with the Mediterranean diet mm -hmm. and see how you can slowly incorporate it into being more of a habit than a hardship. You said it so well. Yes, yeah, so I agree. I usually ask my patients, I see them every three to four months and, and we make a plan that they will try three recipes during that period of time. Because I can tell you, I work with, with Chef Jim Perko, our offices were next to each other and the, and the kitchen was down. Before he perfected one of the recipes, I think I was just enjoying trying different versions. Is this okay? Should I add more of this? Uh, no, this is too, too soft. The point is, even professional executive chefs, <laughs> they take time to develop something that you would say, wow, you know, this tastes good. Yeah, so you have to be gentle, compassionate with yourself. And especially in our culture, when we are not, not cooking and you're not feeling well, yeah, you know, you are not strong enough. Uh, it's very hard to cut that, you know, butternut squash. So you kind of do, do those shortcuts. That's what we do with our patients. We kind of teach them what are the ways they can do to introduce more, more um, you know, whole plant foods. And clearly it's an it's a evolutionary process, yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Golobic. That's you the end are of very the welcome. Questions. Thank you all. Have a great day and enjoy the rest of our program. We will take a about a 10 minute break and we would encourage you once again to uh, to think about visiting our uh, exhibit virtual exhibitor hall we will have a uh, a link up for you to uh, to click on however we would suggest that you copy that and paste that link into a new window uh, on your browser so that you can quickly and easily get back to us here uh, at just about 10 minutes from now 11 10 thank you welcome back i hope you took uh, an opportunity during those 10 minutes to get a healthy snack uh, or get up and move and walk around a little bit uh, that's one of the things we say a lot at parkinson support and wellness keep moving our next presenter is dr barbara walker she recently joined the integrative medicine and executive health teams at uc health the focus of her practice is on health and performance psychology she partners with clients and patients to achieve their optimal energy, health, and performance using a skill-based educational approach to mind-body medicine, using modalities such as biofeedback, relaxation training, mindfulness, solution-oriented cognitive behavioral strategies with the goal of self-regulation. Areas such as sleep, movement, exercise, eating behaviors are addressed. Dr. Walker will be talking about integrating mindful living and we're looking forward to her presentation. Dr. Walker. Good morning. I don't know if most of you have heard the term mindfulness at this point. I think you probably have. But sometimes it's um, difficult to know exactly what that means when it's being thrown around in the popular culture. And I know Dr. Golubic probably talked about that a little bit in his presentation. So I'm just going to go ahead and jump right into what mindfulness is and give a definition. And one of my favorite people who does mindfulness meditation is John Kabat-Zinn, and he really brought mindfulness into our current culture. Um, really in 1979, he started a program called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction and uh, brought that at the, uh, into Massachusetts um, Hospital. And he's been creating this program and a lot of people have, have followed and have been certified in the program. But in terms of his um, definition of mindfulness, I think it's a good one. So I'm going to read through this a little bit, very piece by piece, and then do a little bit of a deep dive into this. 
So mindfulness defined as paying attention in a particular way on purpose in the present moment as non-judgmentally, non-reactively, and open-heartedly as possible. Wouldn't it be wonderful if most of us were like that most of the time? So when we think about um, mindfulness, we're thinking about observation without criticism, being compassionate with yourself, and it's deliberately paying attention to what's happening around you and within you and your body, your heart, your mind. So it's this awareness without, again, criticism or judgment. So think about how often you might be in that space. So when I pull it apart a little bit, when I look at paying attention in a particular way, so to be mindful, you really need to be paying attention, whatever you're choosing to attend to. And we'll talk about that and how you can apply that to daily living in a little bit. And then present moment is really around the reality of being in this present moment, in the here and now. And it means that you just need to be aware of the way things are as they are, not how you wish them to be. That's when we have, um, as we call in, um, uh, we call it dukkha, <laughs> when we're wishing something to be different than what it is. So trying to understand what that is in the present moment. And non-reactively, you understand that. It's all these judgments we have. Um, we react to things. We react in, in, rather than responding to things either internally or externally. So a reaction is really automatic and gives us no choice. But a response is really deliberate and considered action. And then again, non-judgmental, trying to go through life a little bit more um, with ease. And, and same way with open-heartedness, just bringing a quality of kindness, compassion, warmth, and friendliness to your experience. So mindfulness background, um, it's been around for 2,500 years. So it didn't come, um, it, even though it came to um, our Western culture more, more recently in the last few decades, especially in the last decade, we've been hearing more and more about mindfulness. But it's been around for a long time. And it's really from an Eastern philosophy or Easter and meditative practice. But what I want you to know too, it's a complex process. And if you've ever practiced mindfulness, you know that it's complex, but it's really this natural ability. And we'll walk through a couple exercises in just a moment. So it, the idea behind mindfulness is really around synergistically interacting behavioral kind of affective cognitive components. And what I want you to know too, it's not hypnosis. It's not really meant to be relaxation or distraction. It's not really meant to clear your mind. That's really impossible. But what, and it's not religious or faith based. Um, there's so many different versions of meditation in so many of the world's traditions, but we're going to walk through an example in just a moment. So if you would, um, I'm going to take you through a practice here. And go ahead and get yourself in a comfortable position. And I'm going to combine a couple of things here. I want to do a mindful breath um, exercise with you. And then I want to talk about diaphragmatic breathing right at the end. So go ahead and start by settling yourself into a comfortable position. And allow your eyes to close or just keep them at a softened gaze so you can just pay attention to what's going on for you. And then begin by taking a few deep breaths. Slow breaths in fully and exhaling fully. And breathing in through your nose if that's available to you and out through your nose if you can or through your mouth. And just allow your breath to find its own natural rhythm. Bringing your full attention to noticing each in-breath as it enters your nostrils, travels down to your lungs, maybe even causes your belly to expand. And then notice each out-breath as your belly contracts and air moves up through the lungs, back up through your nostrils or mouth. And just sit here for a moment, inviting your full attention to flow with your breath. Maybe notice how the inhale is different than the exhale. You may experience the air as cool as it enters your nose and warm on the exhale. And as you turn more deeply inward, just begin to let go of any noises or sounds around you. 
If you're distracted by sounds in the room, just simply notice them and bring your attention back to your breath. And simply breathe as you breathe, not striving to change anything about your breath. Not trying to control your breath in any way. Observing and accepting your experience in this moment. Without judgment. Paying attention to each inhale and exhale. And if your mind wanders to thoughts, plans, or problems, simply notice your mind wandering and watch the thought as it enters your awareness as neutrally as possible. And then practice letting go of the thought as if it were a leaf floating down a stream, or even allowing your thoughts to go up into a cloud and watching that cloud dissipate. And bring your attention back to your breath, allowing your breath to be an anchor that you can return to over and over again when you become distracted by thoughts. And just notice when your mind has wandered, maybe even observing the types of thoughts that are hooking or distracting you. Noticing is really the richest part of this learning. With this knowledge, you can strengthen your ability to detach from thoughts, and mindfully focus your awareness back on the qualities of your breath. And practicing coming home to the breath with your full attention. Again, maybe watching the gentle rise of your stomach on the in-breath and the relaxing letting go of the out-breath. and allowing yourself to be completely with your breath as it flows in and out. You might become distracted by pain or discomfort or twitching or itching. That draw your attention away from your breath and remember that's very usual, very normal. You may also notice feelings arising, perhaps sadness or happiness, frustration, contentment. Acknowledge whatever comes up, including thoughts or stories about your experience. Simply noticing where your mind went without judging it, pushing it away, clinging to it or wishing it were different and simply refocus your mind and guide your attention back to your breath. Just a few more moments here, breathing in and breathing out, following that air all the way in and all the way out. Just mindfully being present moment by moment with your breath. And just stay here for just a moment and pay attention to how your body feels overall, what you're thinking about. If you're able to bring yourself back, do you feel a little different than you did when you started? And I'm, before you open your eyes, I want to just walk through a little bit of a diaphragmatic breath with you. You've already been doing this breath in and out. And when we talk about belly breath, what we wanna do, I don't want you to overthink it, <laughs> but allowing yourself as you're breathing in, it's a little different than a normal breath, but allow your belly to just rise with your chest. And then as you exhale, just feel your belly contracting. We'll just do this for another minute or so. And you can feel, if you want to put your hand on your belly or your hand on your heart, just to feel that belly rising. We've been so trained to contract our muscles all the time in our belly, kind of holding that in. And I'll talk about the science with that in just a moment, but allowing yourself just to stay with that breath. 
You can even find a count that might work for you to keep you focused. It could be one, two, three, four, five in, and one, two, three, four, five out. Make it an even from your inhale to your exhale. Some of my patients even put some words into their breath so you could say peace on your in-breath, relax on the out-breath. Just allow yourself to stay focused on this. And remember that the breath is always with you as a refocusing tool to bring you back to the present moment. And whenever you are ready, you can open your eyes. Hopefully everyone is still awake. <laughs> good. Good, Dr. G's doing a little stretch, it's good. Yeah, stretch yourself around so you can stay awake and listen. <laughs> good, so that's mindfulness and it generally starts with the breath. Um, what I love about the breath is it's free and portable, right? We have it with us all the time. And we, when we were born, we used to breathe with this diaphragmatic breathing pattern. And um, just from life stress and life activities, we end up letting go of that. So practicing that and coming back to that, and we'll apply that to how that could look um, on a daily basis for you. Um, so when we're talking about breathing deep into the belly, the other piece from the science part is um, it's affecting your autonomic nervous system, which is your, you, it, uh, your fight or flight system that we have. And so allowing yourself to breathe deeply into your belly allows you to f affect your vagal nerve, which is part of what's called your parasympathetic system. It's probably too much information, but the idea of really being able to, this is mind body at its finest, being able to calm that down. And then giving yourself this nice larger breath than normal, what ends up happening is um, whenever we get a negative or an anxious thought in our head, we start contracting muscle fibers and we start breathing really shallowly. So really focusing on a little bit bigger breath than your normal breath, not so big that you feel lightheaded if that happens back off a notch, but the idea of really focusing on this breath is sort of the, the, the first key to being able to manage the stress. So I can't talk about mindfulness without talking about stress and perceived stress um, because they're, um, the, the, we know that there's a lot of stress always, it seems, in our culture at the moment. And I'm sure with dealing with some of the, um, the symptoms that you have, sometimes you, you can attest to that. So just in terms of the definition of stress, it's a nonspecific response to a demanding or threatening event. It's a state or, of mental or emotional strain or tension resulting from adverse or very demanding circumstances. And I put the word perceive there purposely because what happens a lot of times is we are perceiving some stress that might not be a true stressor, um, but when we react as if it is a stressor, our body goes into this fight or flight mode. So generally, perceived stress, you know, it's being too routine or getting caught up sometimes with our thoughts and the future or past um, gets us in the way of that present moment awareness that we're trying to have for meditation or for mindfulness. So um, it is everywhere, you know, stress, <laughs> it's not going to go away. And there's a time and place, obviously, for reacting. But when we stay in that stress place, and we're going to talk about some studies in a second, but it keeps us in what I call this cave person mode. So it keeps us in this place where we're overreacting, we're misperceiving potential threats, we feel irritable. Um, we stay on survival mode or we feel ready to pounce. So maybe some of you can identify what that feels like in your body. So this, um, this graph here is really about that idea, what I talked about before with the autonomic nervous system. So this all starts in our hypothalamus. It's a thought that we have that starts this whole ball rolling. About 20 different things happen physiologically in our body when we start reacting to stressors. So what we want to make sure we do is implement coping techniques, you know, building resiliency and integrating mindfulness into your daily routine that's going to help you reduce that stress response and allow you to be a little bit more mindful. So a couple studies I'm going to go through really quickly. Um, this one looked at stress and mindfulness. And um, looking at patients with Parkinson's disease are really vulnerable to the negative effects of psychological distress. So increases in anxiety, depression, um, tremors, motor skill symptoms, and medication may even prove less effective at times. So the good news is, is a lot of, there's been a lot of studies with mindfulness and evidence is demonstrating that mindfulness-based interventions, which is what we just did, is helping reduce psychological distress and improving clinical symptoms. 
So this other study I thought was interesting. They did a um, survey of 5,000 patients that have Parkinson's disease, and stress significantly worsened both motor symptoms, especially tremors, and non-motor symptoms. And so I won't go through this completely, um, but uh, it's interesting to look at the effect of stress on, on um, the Parkinson's symptoms. We can look on the left hand on that A here. I don't know if this is a pointer. I don't think it does. Um, so on A, it look at the tremor. Um, tremors increase when somebody uh, believes or perceives that they're stressed. Sleeping problems, depressed mood, um, and, and then um, bradykinesia. I can never say that word. Um, gait and freezing and dyskinesia. And so on the other side of that, um, it's just feeling time pressure, social stress, those are the kind of stressors that people were responding to. And this is a really messy slide, um, but I, what I wanted to show you is the middle part there and just talk about that. But this is a perceived effect of mindfulness to reduce stress in patients with PD. And what I found really interesting is that when you look at that graph there in the middle C, that's what I really wanted to show you, is um, the more somebody practiced mindfulness, the better their mood became, less anxious, fewer tremors, sleep, less sleep problems, their gait and freezing um, improved. So it's just several times a day. And I don't mean for you to meditate um, 20 or 45 minutes, you know, three times a day. I'm going to give you some um, ideas about what you can do um, to be able to integrate this into your daily activity. So one of the things I think is interesting to think about like stress hormones when we react to a stressor over time. So this would be an idea of a graph in terms of this, um, when we react to a stressor, what we wanna do is recover really quickly. Um, and of course, if we logically think about that, of course we wanna cover, recover, but a lot of times we don't when we react to a stressor. So what happens is that over a period of time, we lose resiliency, and so we react really quickly. And so the idea behind this is really to get to this place where we're, we are hitting the reset button as quickly as we can, and perhaps even um, trying to train ourselves not to react to the stressor in the first place, which is not always the easiest thing to do. But really finding ways to recover can be as important as successfully face, facing stressors in the first place. So there are a lot of physiological benefits of mindfulness meditation. And a couple of those, um, just pulling from the literature, is lower states of physical arousal. So if you felt a little bit more relaxed during that um, mindfulness meditation that we did just a moment ago, I mean, that's allowing yourself just to kind of calm down and soften. When we talk about um, kind of relaxing the muscles a little bit, it's really paying attention to be able to soften those and recognize where you're holding tension. Decreasing heart rate, um, lower stress, um, calming breathing, and you're, then you're using your oxygen more efficiently when you're, when you're breathing um, with that diaphragmatic breath. Reducing cortisol levels, which is a stress hormone. Um, reducing blood pressure, immune function is better. You're improving in improvements in sleep. And those are just a few, but there's a lot of different studies that are looking at the physiological benefits of this. And then psychological benefits of mindful meditation, I mean, increasing your self-awareness. So just practicing some of these things and slowing down to be able to see what you need and what you're thinking about um, is helpful. So that's allowing you to gain some self-awareness, maybe even where you're holding your muscles more tense than you even realized. Um, so improving your overall um, emotional well-being, better stress management skills, you know, improving your mood, improving um, your working memory and fluid intelligence. And some studies are really showing a benefit in decreasing anxiety and, and um, depression. So the neurological benefits of mindfulness meditation, there have been many there too, with measurable changes in the gray matter in the brain, and that can be involved in memory and learning and emotion. And so um, parts of the brain related to attention, sensory processing, um, again, emotion and stress regulation, empathy, compassion, those are all strengthened with regular practice of, um, of mindfulness meditation. And then the key thing um, really is focusing on controlling the controllables. So I like to think about, and it's kind of reinforcing what um, Dr. Golubek just talked about as well, is what are the basic things that we can do to take care of ourselves and what do we have control over and what we don't have control over? A lot of times when we stay stressed, um, it's because of things that we're trying to control that we don't have control over. So 
sometimes asking yourself a really simple question, right? What can I control in this situation? Like pausing for just a second, um, you know, instead of running around with your hair on fire, right? Um, you can pause and just ask yourself that and maybe you'll get that answer and be able to calm down. Um, so the truth is that we can only control what we think, what we say and what we do. Um, and, we, and the way we respond to events that are outside of ourselves. So accepting what you cannot control and really stopping yourself from wasting any energy on anything else. So I'm gonna just reinforcing what Dr. Golovig already spoke about. You know, when we're focusing on consistent self-care, you know, proper sleep, um, if you can focus on great sleep hygiene, um, eating cleanly, uh, restorative exercise is tolerated, and Tina's gonna talk about that in a little bit, um, connecting with other people, um, making sure you're eliminating any toxins and integrating all recovery activities. Those are all helpful in thinking about these, this baseline controlling the controllables. So when we're practicing some mindfulness meditation, um, it really is cultivating three core skills, and those are concentration, sensory clarity, and equanimity. And so when we're thinking about concentration in particular, it's really obviously the ability to focus and stabilize one's attention. So um, we have so many things coming at us all the time, it seems like nowadays. So being able to improve your attention and concentration will be helpful to be able to slow down a little bit and figure out what you really need. Um, and then sensory clarity is the ability to keep track of the components of sensory experience as they arise in various combinations, like moment to moment, right? So what are you feeling? What are you experiencing? We talked about in that mindfulness meditation that we just did, you know, what, it, what kind of thoughts are coming your way? What are you thinking about? How's your body feel? Um, are you able, you know, where do you hold your tension normally? Are you able to kind of soften that a little bit? And if we don't slow down to take that pause to do that, we'll, we'll never be able to improve ourselves. And then equanimity, which is one of my favorite words, <laughs> it's the ability to be with your experience with an attitude of mental or gentle matter-of-factness. So it's just allowing things to be and, and um, not overreacting to those. So we want to think about mindful awareness of routine activities. So when we're talking about kind of pulling this together for the day, I think it would be impossible to, to live our lives in this Western culture to be completely mindful 24-7, but we can kind of couple and kind of pull together some of these things. So practicing bringing our mindful attention to daily activities you know, that are often performed mindlessly is a good way to do it. So we were just talking on the break, like just when you're walking your dog, right? So you could um, decide to walk a little slower, maybe your dog wouldn't like that too much, or paying attention to your breath with your cadence, or even paying attention to you know, the bird sounds, um, whatever it might be out and about um, when you're outside in particular, which is really healthy for you to be anyway. Um, but maybe even um, calling attention to maybe when you're brushing your teeth or eating a meal. Um, sometimes we practice this exercise, uh, mindful eating. I just gave that to one of my um, classes that I teach at UC, and it's a, eating a raisin, and it takes about 10 or 15 minutes to go through this exercise. Can you imagine one raisin, right? <laughs> um, so maybe your next meal, you could just try to slow down and really pay attention to the flavors. Um, you know, walking, again, at bedtime, maybe a particular routine, maybe just when you're sitting and talking with your significant other or your kids or your spouse, whoever that might be, um, you can even just do it when you're drinking your one cup of coffee that was suggested. <laughs> so it's just whatever it might be, it's doing it mindfully, having some mindful awareness of these routine activities that we normally do. So for home practice, just uh, some food for thought that you can try. Um, so continue to practice this diaphragmatic breathing. It's a little bit of an art. I think Tina's going to talk a little bit about breath as well. Um, you know, choosing one routine in your life um, that you could start. Um, when you talked about from the question and answer session from Dr. Golubik's talk, you know, doing something maybe three days a week or one, three recipes over a few month period, whatever it might be, you decide how slowly you need to go at this. Um, if you haven't, if this is completely new to you, this whole concept, it, um, and we said, you know, the best way to meditate or do mindfulness would be, you know, 20 minutes twice a day. If you did that in silence a couple of days in a row, you would probably say, oh my gosh, Dr. Walker is not gonna, I'm not gonna do this anymore, right? So you gotta start small. So even starting with what I'm suggesting here, like creating peaceful a, a peaceful living environment. So at least in one room, right? So, or leaving a, a spot in the room, depending on how big of a space you have. 
um, making sure that you just create some spot for you that you know that you can go to. Um, it's, I think it's really challenging, difficult to be in a, a place where there's a lot of chaos going on or a lot of stuff um, around, even though you're going to probably mostly do this with your eyes closed. And then establishing a daily meditation or mindfulness practice. One of those things could be, um, you know, we call habit stacking in my lane of work. So it could be like right when you get out of bed, or it could be like as soon as you finish your coffee, or after you exercise, or after you shower, whatever it might be. So you can habit stack it. So instead of a, if I would say, oh, the best time to meditate for you, if I I predicted that and said, um, or prescribed that and said it's at 2 p.m., you know, and you're it's in the middle of your day, you again wouldn't wouldn't make it a routine. So figuring out what works for you. A lot of suggestions are to do kind of bookend your days. That's what I suggest for patients. And then again, start really small. If this is again, brand new to you, you I'm gonna give you some examples for some apps that are out there. There's a lot on YouTube. There's a lot of information out there and actually for free that you don't need to pay for mindfulness meditation any longer. Um, but again, practicing the breath, um, focusing on one routine activity that you can um, apply to your life. And, um, and again, that's as we already talked about, like just simply focusing on one thing, um, choosing something that you can practice during the week. And that, again, that could be one mindful meal and simply focusing on knowing what you're doing as you are actually doing it instead of the multitasking that sometimes that we do. So some um, resources and further study. So I think you may have already spoken about this. I do a little meditation on Monday mornings and you can see the, um, the website there. Um, that has all our classes and events with integrative medicine and that's a variety of guided meditations i just kind of pick something that i want to do for that that um that week and you can pop on and you don't have to show yourself you can show yourself and say hi for a second but most people don't show their video and um but that's a really nice way to start the week um so additional classes i i put that there can be found at that same site there's several books there's so many books out that are beautiful um, that talk about mindfulness and meditation. One of the books that has an eight-week plan is that third book there. I use that for a course that I use at, um, at UC in a positive psychology class that I teach. And um, it's great because there's little downloads, audio downloads, and the guy's voice is very nice. Um, so then there's some apps there that you could download as well, Insight Timer. That's my favorite one, and the only reason it's my favorite um, now, I don't know if anybody else has that, but there's like 140,000 meditations on there, and that might seem overwhelming. They're very well organized, but, um, but when, it, when practicing some of these things, what's nice is that if you don't like one person's voice, you can go to somebody else, or if you don't like what they're saying, you can just find somebody else, um, depending on where you are. There's also music on there that you could just listen to to kind of keep that kind of calm space. Um, and then there's several other apps that are very popular on there as well. So thank you very much. I'm going to open that up to some questions. Thank you. So far, no questions, but okay. we're hoping. <laughs> Hopefully everyone's awake. <laughs> And if anybody thinks of questions later, or you need some other resources. I have my email address on there too. If you, um, if you need, if you want to, please feel free to reach out to me as well. I have a question about the sensory clarity. Can you expand on that a little bit more? Sure. So when you're taking that pause and kind of slowing down a little bit, um, the sensory clarity is that um, to understand what's really happening in your mind and body. So it's it's literally gaining clarity over your senses. Um, if that makes sense. So a lot of times, I'll give you one example. So when COVID first hit, I was asked to do this mindful meditation for faculty. And at one point, I was literally doing it three times a day, like <laughs> three times a day for five days a week, which was a little crazy. But one, this one particular meditation, it's um, a body scan exercise where you're not really trying to really soften your muscles, but you're kind of going through each muscle and you're, I'm, I'm guiding somebody through that and the interesting thing is, is the more you do those kind of things, you might not even recognize, let's say, like right now, if I could say, like, I'm really focusing on my trapezius muscles, right? What happens is that when you're slowing down, you're resetting, you're doing a little breath, and you're really paying attention to specific muscle groups, 
you end up gaining the clarity I gained was that, wow, I could continue to soften. I could continue to soften. Like I thought it was, you know, as soft as I could be, right? But you're, you're sitting there and talking through that and you can just gain that idea of just really, not even idea, it's really changing yourself physiologically of really letting loose. And so, and that's the same thing with the sensory clarity with um, your thoughts. Right? A lot of times we don't slow down, we don't think about maybe we're connecting something and kind of beating ourselves up or thinking about something that's not no longer true or never was true in the first place. So it's really allowing you to create that mental and physical space to be able to gain that clarity. Yeah, good question. Yeah. I don't think we have any more. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. just mentioned to Dr. Walker that I feel better already. Uh, we're going to take another 10 minute break. We'll be back in 10 minutes. Again, we would invite you to get up and move around thoughtfully and, uh, and also to uh, visit our exhibition hall. Uh, you see the uh, links there. And uh, again, we would ask you to make sure that you open up a new browser window when you go there so that you can Come back and join us in uh, 10 minutes when we will practice yoga. Well, I love this picture that um, Dr. G put up here of this yogi lady. I have to relate to her. <laughs> um, and my colleagues think I'm believable when I present, and it's because I have two artificial hips. I just want to make that clear, and I'm not going to tell you my age, but I do like her. My name is Tina Walter. I'm a certified yoga therapist at UC Health, and I um, have an advanced study certification in yoga therapy for cancer and chronic illness, and I've been working in the yoga therapy world for over 10 years in hospitals, three local hospitals and a Northern Kentucky hospital, working with people uh, with chronic conditions and using the tools of yoga in a more um, therapeutic way, in a more personalized, customized way. I'm passionate about yoga. I believe in it. It helped me so much during my prehabilitation, my surgeries, my recoveries, and I've been practicing for a long time. Dr. G said my yoga mat looks it. It's, um, it's gotten some, <laughs> some wear and tear. Um, and I, I have dummied down the practice many times. I've modified the practice. I've used pieces of the practice. Even the breathing I've used. I've used the awareness practice. So I just want to say that um, there are many, many wonderful ways to use yoga. Today I'm going to talk about how a yoga practice can help improve functional changes in Parkinson's disease. I don't have many slides because I want to go through this and really give you an experience and get you moving. So today I thought I would talk about the different styles of yoga. We hear so much about yoga. It gets a bad rap. I think people have some misunderstandings. They think that it's a really tough practice often. You have to be able to put your foot behind your head. I've heard many people say, I'm not flexible. I can't do yoga. I don't like it. Um, I, I don't have that kind of flexibility. And really, yoga is about awareness first, and then the breath, and then the asana, or the poses. So. As you know, it's really not always about movement. It has a lot to do with breathing, meditation. So I want to talk a little bit about those today and the benefits. It's different than exercise in that yoga asks us to be aware of what we're doing and focus on our breath while we are moving. So the connection of the breath with the movement is what's being researched and known to rewire the patterns of our brain that cause stress and anxiety. So that's really the benefit of it and the difference between yoga and exercise. And they think it's very, very helpful for people with Parkinson's disease. 
um, different types of yoga from hot yoga to aerial yoga. It's popular uh, vinyasa flow. Vinyasa means continuous flow with breath, uh, movement with breath. There's no break in the flow. So you can get into a class and flow really quickly from one pose to the next. Um, it can be a very strenuous practice. But today I wanna to talk about more hatha yoga. Hatha is more foundational and all yogas are springing from the foundation of hatha yoga. Hatha means sun and moon. And it basically is the opposites. It's balancing opposites in yoga. Always effort, ease, um, grounding, lifting, uh, breath, no breath, you know, retention of breath. There, there's always the opposites in a Hatha class. So we're going to do a little bit of that in a little bit. Ways yoga therapy can support people with Parkinson's disease, balance, flexibility, strength. And um, the yoga therapy classes that you see focus on these things. Balance, flexibility, strength are offered weekly free of charge for people with Parkinson's disease. Yoga practices can include, yoga therapy practices can include meditation, breathing, not just movement, relaxation practices, guided imagery, and the asana, the physical postures. And really, it's up to you to decide what feels good, how to modify. I'm always modifying the poses. I'm using chairs, I'm using props. When you're home, uh, think about what prop you can use today. Can you use a chair without arms? Grab one if you have it. Do you have a yoga block? If you don't, grab a thick pillow. Grab something that, that is gonna support you in your practice. Lots of chair yoga, lots of restorative yoga. I believe in modifying the practice to make it work for you. It's very adaptable. It's an adaptable practice. The benefits are it decreases anxiety and depression, helps reduce muscle tension, increases flexibility, range of motion, and balance can control pain, promote self-healing, and improves overall quality of life and feeling of well-being. So the practice begs us to make it regular. If you come to a yoga class and it doesn't fit your need or you take one online and it isn't something that you like, continue to kind of search and find the right teacher, something that feels good for you, the right movements that feel good. Think about how you feel the next day, because the idea is you want to do something that is supporting you and you can use the tools throughout your day. And really it's a regular practice. That's the whole beauty of it. You want to find something that you can do regularly and it's doable. So whether it's virtual, whether you're going into a community class, find something that really benefits you, a class that benefits. Here's just a little bit of research. I think Dr. G mentioned the functional changes in Parkinson's disease. It can be balanced. This particular study um, talked about functional improvements in Parkinson's following a randomized trial of yoga done in 2018. It specifically looked at balance and how it affected that. Motor function, the impact of mind-body exercises on motor function, depression, quality of life. And that was done in 2020. Regarding motor function, really they're looking at, again, that opportunity to connect breath with movement. That slow, repetitive movement connected with breath can be very good for the neurological system. And I just, I, I side with Barbara Walker. I love John Kabat-Zinn. The only place you can ever be is where you are. Again, yoga offers us that opportunity to go inside and be with what is. And, you know, in our busy culture, um, life just pulls us in every direction. The goal, the ultimate goal of yoga 
is really to find that stillness that exists in us and every one of us. And when you lie down in Shavasana after a class in that final resting where you're letting all the benefit of the practice come to you, you kind of get it. If you're in the right class, maybe take a real special look at, at Shavasana, how it resonates with you. If you're able to kind of get a glimmer of that stillness, that equanimity, that feeling of peacefulness. I think it's the class for you. And then the next, if you're creating a future that doesn't exist yet, then that's the definition of worry. Um, this quote was from the late Yanni Chapman, founder of the Y Cat Yoga Therapy and Cancer and Chronic Illness. And what you resist persists. So I'm going to go ahead and um, give you a little practice here. I thought we would start in a chair without arms that's supportive. I'm going to have you sit and scoot yourself from the back of the chair. Uh, you have an option. If you don't want to scoot yourself up, I would like your feet to be on the floor. But if you're way back here, I just want to make sure that your back can be supportive. And notice that I have a block. You can put a pillow back here because when that gives you that support you need in your spine, you're able to really sit upright. I'm gonna begin by mentioning that there were five seated poses originally in yoga. Five seated poses so that the ancients could sit and meditate. It was all about the integrity of the spine, alignment and strength, so that they could sit quietly. And I love that because we've taken it in this country and turned it into an Olympian feat, but it's really five seated poses. How are we sitting? So we're gonna sit really upright. We're gonna do our yoga and this is where we start. It's our foundation and it's the best pose of all. It's called Sukhasana, easy seat. So you're gonna sit, ground the feet, allow your sitting bones to be rooted in the chair. Somebody said, I haven't heard that expression in a lot of, long time. Sit bones is actually the correct terminology. And we each have two. So I want you to kind of think about letting those just sink and settle, letting your feet settle. Okay, hands can be, palms can be up, palms can be down, you choose. And I want you to think about from the tailbone up through the crown of the head being tall, shoulders back in line with ears, ears back in line with shoulders. And then from here, if you could relax the shoulders down your back and take special attention now to the rib cage and allow it to soften, but allow the lower ribs to kind of course it together and down so that you aren't really pushing the ribs out or, you know, kind of, um, kind of letting your tailbone kind of drop under. I want you to think about rooting with this core support, this idea of stability here. In yoga, we call it solar plexus. But this is kind of where your core support comes from, right at the rib cage. So I want you even to place a hand there, a hand on the belly. Relax the shoulders, close the eyes and just begin to allow yourself to sink and soften, even though the crown of your head is moving upward and you are lifted but rooted, rooting to rise. Soften the shoulders, soften the jaw, soften the eyelids, close the eyes. If you don't wanna close your eyes, you're just focusing on a spot in front of you that doesn't move lowering your eyes and begin to just watch the breath, softening the belly and the rib cage. Notice the breath coming in. Notice the breath leaving. A few times, not manipulating it, just with that soft trunk giving your body freedom to let that diaphragm move now a little bit more. 
Maybe even noticing the hands moving in the belly. The hands moving, maybe you notice the breath connecting a little deeper. And if you don't, that's okay. Okay, this is just about your breath. I don't want you to feel any reaching, striving, or struggling. I just want you to soften so much that you might feel it a little bit more. If you don't, it's okay. Begin to allow the exhale to maybe lengthen a little bit longer so that you're not cheating the exhale. Maybe your exhale can be a little bit of a nudging out to the very, very end. And continue this pattern of breathing, smoothing out the inhale and the exhale. Deepening the breath a little bit. Just noticing where do you feel the breath most easily and steadily? Is it in the nostrils, maybe the throat, maybe the belly? Good, go ahead and release the arms now. Keeping the eyes closed, just notice Moving inside, maybe notice any sensations of the breath now as it's moving. Good, and then go ahead and blink the eyes open. We're gonna begin to move the head and neck a little bit, start our movement. Drop the right ear to the right shoulder. And I don't want you to push that right ear to the right shoulder, just a gentle dropping keeping in mind that the ears are back in line with the shoulders. Inhale the head up, dropping the left ear to the left shoulder. And can you do this in a way that feels good? You're not pushing or over striving. You're just connecting that breath with the movement. Just dropping, releasing the shoulders. Try to keep the shoulders out of the equation totally. You're isolating the muscles in the head and neck so that the shoulders, the traps aren't being used. That's where we hold all the tension and tightness. Often in our shoulders, we get the, get the shoulders involved and our neck gets tight and tense. You're just moving side to side on your own, feeling a gentle stretch on each side, keeping the shoulders relaxed down the back. Thinking about all those muscles that are working to make this happen. Good. Come up to neutral. Roll the shoulders up towards the ears and back down the back. Just a few times at your own. Inhaling and exhaling back. Good. Your own comfort level. We're gonna take the right shoulder and move it up and back, just the right shoulder, isolating that movement. Good, and then the left shoulder, up and back. Notice the difference on the sides. Does one side feel tighter than another? Good, then we're gonna go side to side. Forwards and backwards, side to side. A little bit of a walking and chewing gum kind of thing. Good, and then we're gonna go the other way, backwards to forwards on each side. Great, come down, relax the arms. Look down at the feet, make sure that they're plugged in, the seat is plugged in. We're gonna take our arms up overhead now for a little bit of a seated extended mountain, just breathe in. And as you breathe in, you're gonna root the feet, root the seat, lift up through the side body. Maybe even look up at your hands. And if this is your extension, that's fine. If this is your extension, that's fine. 
okay? Yoga is about finding something that works for you, right? So if this doesn't feel good and you can't get your arms all the way up, bend your elbows, doesn't matter what it looks like, okay? Breathe in, big breath in, good. And then as we exhale out, we're gonna hinge at the hips. And I'm just gonna show you a gentle hinge. It's not a rounding, it's a hinging at the hips. So you're coming forward like your heart is being pulled forward with a string. And you don't have to go down so far. Good, pressing through the feet, engaging your abdominals and that core that I taught you earlier, you're gonna lift up on an inhale. This brings a lot of great circulation to the spine, blood flow, big breath in. It's great for digestion. Exhale into that forward fold, coming a little forward, only to your comfort level, and inhale up. Nice, one more time on your own, big breath in length, and then find that nice forward fold, nice long spine from tailbone out through the crown of the head, you're long, nothing dangerous, good. And then come all the way up, breathing in and relax the arms down to the side, good. Notice how you feel. Remember, the most important thing in yoga is awareness. Let's bring our hands to the knees and as we think about cat-cow pose, we're going to think about length in the spine. And we're going to slide the hands to the hip creases as we inhale. And as we inhale, we're going to just slightly lift the sternum and go into a little bit of an extension. If you can let your head drop back some, great. If you can't, that's OK. But it's a breath in to lift slight arch. And exhale, round the back, slide the hands to the knees. You're dropping the head, coming into a slight flexion. If this doesn't feel good, you stay in neutral spine. Neutrality is always that core engagement, straight spine. Tiny bit of flexion if that feels good. Good. And then inhale back up to open. Little arch lift, inhale, and exhale round into your cat back if it feels OK. Back up the bus if it doesn't. And then go on your own, a few on your own. This helps uh, stability of the hips. This really does a lot of um, great work for the pelvis because it helps with a lot of the flexibility of the pelvis. Because as you notice, your pelvis is moving here. It can help bring new blood into the spine, circulation. Breathing in, breathing out, always connecting breath with movement. Good. Come up, sit, relax the shoulders. Notice how you feel. Maybe a little taller. Maybe your breath is moving a little bit. Notice the quality of your breath after movement. Great. Now we're going to take the left hand, bring it to the right knee. This is a twist, and it might be enough twist for you. I'm going to take my right hand and place it on my left shoulder. So this is a twist in itself, and maybe you just stay here. But the whole idea is you never want to twist a crooked spine. So think length. Again, your feet are working. Your seat is working tall. You're going to trace your hands slowly across your collarbone as you inhale. And exhale, open. Really smile through the collarbone, start twisting up and over the right shoulder if it feels okay. You can just be here. You never have to twist that much. Let your left hand anchor your right knee and use it as a guide, like hand to knee, knee to hand, pressing in to kind of anchor the twist. Hips aren't involved. Keep it safe. And then exhale, give yourself a half hug. Okay, come back. Just half hug couple times on your own, breathing in, tracing that collarbone, smile through the collarbones, see how you can work those intercostal muscles around the rib cage, with help, which helps with breath. We're using those muscles to breathe, to oxygenate. So anytime you can work those muscles, it's great. Come in half close, half hug, come back to center, 
realign. Realignment is always lift up through the crown of the head. If someone has a string attached to the crown of your head tall, you're exhaling opening. One last time. Your gaze can even go back to your right thumb if your shoulders allow. Relax the shoulders. Good, and then come back. Good, and we're gonna go to the other side. 10 minutes here. <laughs> you know what, instead of doing the other side, I think I'm gonna stand and show you a few things. But I showed you that technique, so after this, make sure you get the other side, okay? I don't wanna miss my standing poses for you. Because standing poses build strength, and they help improve muscles in the legs and really can build bone health, which we all need um, a lot of, of uh, weight-bearing exercises. So we're gonna stand in mountain pose, and I'm gonna hold on to a chair. So make sure you have your chair close, and look down and bigger toes are closer than heels. So it's a little bit of a pigeon-toed type of stance. We are going to come onto the big toe mound of the foot, kind of rock onto the big toe mound and the inner ankle. And then we're gonna rock back to the outer parts of the feet. The, uh, they call it the knife edge side of the feet, the pinky toe side. And we're gonna do that a few times, rocking in, rocking out, until you're feeling like you can feel all four corners of the feet. Then you're gonna root down through all four corners of the feet and see if you can push the earth away. Push the earth away with all four corners of your feet. If you don't feel your feet, uh, you're growing seaweed. You know, I always tell people with neuropathy, it, you're always thinking about rooting, sending roots down to the earth with your feet, but if you don't feel the bottoms of your feet, think about seaweed, some kind of an anchor, okay? Get creative. We're gonna lift our kneecaps as we push the earth away and kind of engage the quads. Think about spinning the inner thighs back. Your tailbone anchors straight down, okay? You see people who are super tuckers with the head forward, and you see people who let their ribs flare. Again, ribs corseted in and down. This is where your strength comes. And so from here, you're pushing the earth away. You feel strong in the core and you're able to lift up through the crown of the head. Good. Let your arms relax. And it's just yoga, people. So relax, okay? It's just yoga. <laughs> Have a little fun with it. And then maybe think about the bottom half of our body is effort, and the top half is, is ease. Here's that hatha, that effort and ease. Relax the shoulders. Are you breathing? Do you stop breathing when you're stressed? Do you stop breathing when you're doing your yoga? You just keep breathing. And you're letting the crown of your head reach. Good. Rooting to rise. Mountain pose. Great. This is the, the foundational pose for every yoga pose. If you're not in mountain, you're not doing yoga. Let's go ahead and lift the arms. And if you're not breathing, you're not doing yoga. So make sure you're breathing. Big breath in. Really good. And then exhale. Push that energy downward, energy upward, energy rooting. Let's go ahead, flip the palms up three times. Inhale, push that energy up, lift, and exhale, reaching through the side body. We sit so much, our side bodies get stuck. One last time, lift that side body. Really nice, good, and exhale, palms together, samastiti. Samastiti, good, and tree pose. So let's just do one balance pose. We're gonna start on our left foot in mountain. Take our right toes out to the side, okay? You can keep your right toe down, but look down and make sure it's on the same plane. You don't want the foot way out here, or way behind here, on the same plane. Good, and you can bring the foot to the top. You can leave it there dumping weight into the left leg. I want you to kind of play with it. Hold on to a chair if you need to. And kind of find your own tree. 
Okay, think about rooting and grounding. Great. And then we're going to go to the other side. Left toes out. Really commit to the standing leg. Root to rise. And then find a tree on the other side. Hold on to the chair if you need to. Great. And I think my time is up. Um, I'm going to sit back down and I'm going to encourage you, those of you watching, to take a Shavasana. So you're just lying down on your couch, you're sitting in your chair, you're lying down on the floor, you're covering yourself with blankets, you're taking extra special care to find your Shavasana, which is a deep resting pose. Make sure your head is supported. Close the eyes and just notice again that peacefulness within. Notice all the benefits of the movement of the breath of the awareness. And see if you can, at this time, surrender. Surrender even the breath, letting go of any need to try to fix, change, judge, compare, do. You're just noticing. And the benefit, the magic happens in the noticing and the, the surrendering. Thank you for sharing this gift of your practice with me today. Namaste. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> yeah. Yes. I think yes. Now people say that bare feet, if there's any air or cold, can cause uh, a neuro the neuropathy to get worse. So I tell people to wear socks if that is the case. But if neuropathy doesn't bother you, yes, bare feet for sure, because you can really feel circulation better. It, it just works better. I'd like you to feel your toes. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to be here. As we prepare for our next speaker, we'll take uh, this time just a five minute break so that we can uh, perhaps get you back to your day uh, a little bit faster than uh, we had, had planned. So uh, if you will, uh, take five minutes and uh, join us again. Uh, we invite you to visit the exhibition hall one last time, and we'll see you in five minutes. Good morning still, almost afternoon. Um, I hope you're feeling as inspired as I feel and as calm. Uh, and I'm so pleased that I now have a good excuse to drink coffee. Um, and so I hope you're feeling relaxed, but I hope this next talk will inspire you. My name is Mira Rostogi. I'm a licensed psychologist and a board certified registered art therapist. And I'm here to talk to you about art therapy and Parkinson's. And so a little overview of the talk. I'm first going to introduce some artists that have Parkinson's. I kept one image in by an artist who does not have Parkinson's, and I'll explain a little bit why I included that one, but all the other artwork is done by people with Parkinson's. Then I'm gonna explain what art therapy is, how art therapy works. We'll cover a little bit of research on art therapy and we'll talk about caregivers and care providers and is art therapy for me or you. And so here's the first image and I, I think images really tell a story and particularly in art therapy, images tell a story of where somebody's been, where they currently are and where they're going. And this image I kept in, even though I debated with myself, should I keep this in? Because this was done by an artist, Anita Kuntz, 
for uh, somebody with Parkinson's, Jennifer Parkinson, as a tribute about her life story. And the title of it is called Live Well, Do Well. And Anita was inspired by Jennifer Parkinson's struggle with early onset Parkinson's. She was diagnosed when she was 32 years old. And Jennifer started a boxing uh, program for people with Parkinson's. And Anita was really inspired by how resilient uh, Jennifer was despite her early diagnosis. And even during those moments where her limbs feel rooted to the ground and she's frozen from her symptoms, she still is fighting literally and symbolically um, against uh, Parkinson's disease. And the next person I'd like to introduce you to is Margaret Ray, who's another artist who has Parkinson's. And this image she created to show that she still goes dancing. She enjoyed it before she got Parkinson's and she is going to enjoy it until she no longer can. She talks about how this image shows the togetherness of doing a dance together, dancing through um, and joining. It's collaborative and this image so powerfully shows that strong bond and that will to enjoy things as long as she can. The next image is a little disturbing, but um, this is by a painter who was diagnosed with Parkinson's and he was tracking his good and bad days. And why I picked this image, even though it's a little disturbing, is if you overlook the skull part, he was doing a still life, which that means trying to accurately portray an image as you see it. And he started tracking his symptoms on his good day. He could see colors clearly. He had control over his movements. So on your left, you see his, his good days. And then he also did a same still life of the skeleton. It, it was a skeleton model in his studio. And on his bad days, he has trouble differentiating colors, trouble controlling his movements. And why I chose to include this image in, in these slides is to show how much these images speak volumes about the ups and downs of his symptoms. And loved ones who don't have Parkinson's may have difficulty understanding the power that symptoms have over people, but this Im these images and comparing this artwork clearly communicates his struggle and um, with uh, things that come so easily to him are even so difficult. And that is really hard to capture that difficulty in words. And when you see the images, you can really see how difficult living with this disease is on some days. This artist really struck a chord with me. His name is Wendell Lowe. And he was a practicing artist and an art teacher before he was diagnosed with Parkinson's. And when he was diagnosed, um, his movements got so severe that he decided he was going to create artwork using finger paints. And all of this artwork is created by him. He has um, a tool that he uses in the finger paints and he uses his fingers to carve out images. And his goal with his work is to show and help people really feel the symptoms of Parkinson's. And so you can see some of these um, images with the eyes, how he's um, affected with his visual perception, how some of his limbs feel stuck, and um, you know maybe how he feels about his body and sometimes feeling overwhelmed. But his real goal is helping to communicate what those symptoms really feel like. And I think he does an excellent job. So art therapy is not becoming an artist. Even though I've shown you those pictures, I really wanted to show you how powerful art can tell a story. Art therapy is not about creating beautiful images, being a highly skilled artist. You can do art therapy even if um, you feel like you draw like a first grader, um, which I hear every day I do this work. 
Um, and so art therapy is not about becoming a great artist. So you might be asking, well, what the heck is art therapy then? And so what art therapy does, and I have this table because I think it clearly shows, an artist has clear knowledge of art materials and understanding of aesthetics, and a counselor has counseling skills, group therapy skills, and an art therapist is combining those. They have knowledge of how the materials work, how they impact people emotionally, what materials might be useful depending on the symptoms you're experiencing and then how can we use the art image to help create healing to help give you a voice um, to help you find the words that you may find very difficult to articulate what you're going through and so you might be wondering, well, all of this is nice, uh, an art class would be lovely, but how does art therapy actually work? And so when you're diagnosed with a medical illness, you, and I, I'm, I'm probably talking to many of you who could say much more about this, it causes a sense of disorganization internally. You never imagined that this would happen to you. This was not part of your life dream or your goals. And so becoming very disoriented, feeling out of control, realizing that you're gonna have a loss of independence can really take a toll on your identity, your self-esteem, your confidence, and it can also create a lot of isolation. And so art therapy gets you physically active. It causes you, requires physical movement. You begin to express your feelings through your artwork and research has shown this helps increase your ability to find the words to explain what's happening to you. It can also over time create a sense of self-confidence or what, what psychologists call self-efficacy. It helps you build comfort, confidence and a sense of mastery. And it also stimulates those brain cells by trying new things. It also helps you learn how to uh, deal with feelings you might have been trying to avoid in a way that's non-threatening. So in art therapy, I'll ask you to draw something and you think, okay, I'll draw this. And then as we talk about it, you open up um, to, in, in ways that feel more comfortable and safe to explain what's going on with you. It can also cause increased connectedness, particularly if you do art therapy in a group. And this can provide a great sense of connectedness, decreasing isolation, and can provide meaning, new meaning and purpose. Art therapy can help work through some of the disorganization to help you develop a new identity separate from your illness, and it can also help provide personal insight. And then some really nerdy facts. Um, uh, when you do artwork similar to meditation, similar to yoga, it activates this part of your brain that helps you turn inward, that helps you go into a meditative state. Some people say it's a flow state. And then by doing the therapy, it helps you reason and think about things in new ways. So it's operating on different brain networks. So how does, oh, did I go backwards? Oh, so I wanted to demo <laughs> um, how art therapy works, since it's a little hard to have you, um, you may not have art supplies at home. You might be wondering, well, how does this work? Okay, I get that um, Dr. Ristogi will have me paint this picture, but then how do we do the therapy piece? So I picked a couple examples to walk you through how we would do this. So Margaret Ray is not a client of mine. She's not a client of, of art therapy that I know of, but if she painted this in an art therapy group I was in, we might look at these hands and explore them deeper. One way I might explore these hands deeper would be to ask her to give each hand a voice. So when you see the hand in the front, the hand seems kind of, um, kind of uh, comforted by the other hand. So the hand might say, 
you feel warm, I enjoy your comfort, I like how you're guiding me and helping me as we dance together. And then if we were going to give a voice to the hand that's holding the other hand, that she might say that hand wants to hold you steady, wants to provide you support. And so Margaret may not be able to find those words that she's trying to express through this image, but by an art therapist facilitating that process to go deeper, she may find new words to express um, what, what is going on with her. This is a painting, not from an art therapy session that I did, but um, from an article I found about art therapy for people with Parkinson's. And Rita painted this image of um, her standing out of her, her window with her Parkinson's medicines to the right. This would be a fairly typical art therapy image. And so if I were having Rita in a group and we got this image, how might, how might we discuss this? You know, I'm really struck by Rita facing the window and the outside beautiful world is going on b beside her and she's stuck behind this window. To me, it um, has a sense of isolation. So I would ask Rita, are you feeling isolated and separated from the world around you? What is a way that we can add to this image, that we can look at this image differently and help you get into the world with the flowers blooming? We might explore deeper this relationship with her medications. Uh, it's pretty interesting Rita chose to put her medications in here. How is she feeling about those? Those are on the inside with her as compared to the outside of the world around her. So we would talk about what, what she might be experiencing. I don't know if she is, but that um, as the therapist, that's the kind of conversation we'd have to go deeper and understand things deeper. So you might be asking, does art therapy actually work? Uh, and so art therapy can address both motor symptoms and non-movement sim symptoms. Traditionally, art therapy has focused on the non-movement symptoms, such as improving mood and quality of life. But newer studies that are coming out, and they're small studies, have looked at some of the motor symptoms. And so I'll, go, I'll review some of those studies. So art therapy does have several studies that have shown improvements in mental health, and that's been long focused on studies on art therapy, that it does improve mood, decreases anxiety, improves quality of life, and help people, it helps people to express what they're feeling. What is more interesting, more recent studies, one isolated, um, found that art therapy tend to help people feel less sleepy and more wakeful. And so we all know some people have difficulty sleeping with Parkinson's. And so if this helps you get more alert, great. Research has also found that art therapy can help with motor function and reducing tremors. And so studies have been done working with clay and um, working with drawings that uh, that helps to improve motor function and a more recent study that is really fascinating but again it's one small study has found that art therapy did improve the visual network in the brain and the visual cognitive skills so there are some promising results that um, with more studies might show that art therapy does indeed target not motor and non-motor symptoms of parkinson's and then I want to include, wanted to include caregivers and care providers because they're often overlooked and they experience an enormous amount of stress. Many caregivers and care providers have a lot of physical demands, unexpected changes, grief and loss, especially if you're a caregiver dealing with the financial implications of the illness. And they too often lack support and isolation. Care providers can um, and caregivers can feel a sense of resentment. This can all of this can lead to poor care, mistakes, 
impatience, and irritation. So I'd also encourage care providers and caregivers to do some self-care, and art therapy is a great way to do this. And many hospitals have art therapy programs for care caregivers and care providers. And I'd suggest separating the group. My experience has been when you have everybody in the same room, the care provider wants to care um, for the person who's the artist doing the artwork. And really we wanna empower that person to do the art on their own, to have a sense of independence. And we want to empower the caregiver to do something for themselves. And so art therapy is a great way to do that, um, to get some refueling in your tank so that um, you can attend to the, to the things you need to attend to and not result in burnout. So you might be thinking, is art therapy for me? And I would say, are you op we're open to working with art materials? You don't have to think you're good. You don't even have to have any experience, but would you just like to try it out? Do you want some emotional support and relaxation? Then I would encourage you to join a group. We offer a free group at the Neuroscience Institute. We're running it virtually and in person on Mondays one to three. And if you are not local, you might want to schedule an appointment with an art therapist. You can do a Google search for art therapist locator or go to the art therapy credentials board and find a credentialed art therapist. And then I'm gonna leave you with a really inspiring story of Norman Greenstein, who has labeled himself the Parkinson's painter, who came to become an artist. I'm pretty sure he's gonna say in his 70s. And um, he's just gonna talk about the role of art in his life and uh, how he manages his symptoms. Just off Main Street in Manchester, there are the reds, there are the blues, vibrant colors on canvas. And then there's that gray area. It's the one that Norman Greenstein has been fighting off for 14 years. My family and I went on vacation to the White Mountains in New Hampshire. And I was driving down and I noticed my leg was shaking. I was diagnosed in 2008, and I started painting probably around 2013. Norm's diagnosis, Parkinson's disease. The debilitating effects are robbing him of his mobility, but not his motivation. With a palette and some perseverance, a new enterprise. Well, I had always wanted to try my hand on it. And a new image. Right now, it's a face. The 78-year-old father and grandfather has become the self-proclaimed... The Parkinson's painter. The Parkinson's painter. His hand wavers, but his determination is steady. It is part high gloss and part Bob Ross. Seven years ago, Norm decided to go outside the lines by painting within them. Having art as a hobby or as a profession, it relaxes me to paint. My hand might shake, but I don't paint with my hand. My hand is like an instrument, it's like a brush. I paint with my mind. In his new life, the former nonprofit foundation exec has created more than 100 paintings. There's now a book, there's a website, and at the Workspace Gallery in Manchester, Norm's art adorns the walls. Norm, it just flies in the face of conventional wisdom that somebody with your affliction can paint like this. Well, when my hand shakes too much, I learned a trick. I got to take my right hand with my right hand and I put the brush in my left hand, or sometimes I'll use two hands. Norm will tell you he's still a starving artist, but some paintings carry price tags upwards of $20,000 a piece. 20% of the profits go to Parkinson's charities, 
like the Michael J. Fox Foundation. It's become a whole family project. We have a developer team helping us release his first NFT collection to market. So it's really exciting how many people in the community are inspired by my dad and all the people he's brought together. It makes you think, it makes you feel, and that's what it's about. So we love the fact that people are inspired to create and we love bringing those people together. A few more dabs, some added swirls. There are the reds, there are the blues. And for Norm, the Parkinson's painter, he insists on keeping his days colorful. It's a simple message, right? Yeah, it's a simple message, don't give up. Do what you can and do more. Even a guy with Parkinson's, especially a guy with Parkinson's. In Manchester, Jim Altman, Fox 61 News. And as we said, Norman has his own Parkinson's Painter website where you can see more of his works. We'll have a link at fox61.com and on our Fox 61 News app. And some of Norm's artworks are on display at the workspace in Manchester, guys. Jimmy, thank you so much. I mean, talk about being able to adapt and also being incredibly talented. And what I found Special amazing person. about it, Jimmy, was the fact that he didn't paint prior to his diagnosis. He started five years afterward, right? He had always wanted to be a painter, Ben and Jen, and he took it up after his diagnosis and said, I'm not, I'm not giving up on this. I'm gonna become a it's painter. Incredible. Here we are. Incredible. Yes. We also wanna shout out Norm and his wife, Phyllis, on Thursday, right, Thanksgiving. They're celebrating 50 years of marriage. Wow. Happy and then here's, oops, here's my uh, email. If you have any questions or comments, uh, um, that's available to you. Are there any questions? So when you mentioned materials to promote healing, do you base that on getting to know a person or are there different baseline materials that you use? That's a great question. Um, and so it's a combination of both. There are always individual differences and things people like, but there is a theory in art therapy called the expressive therapies continuum that talks about how different materials do tend to elicit certain emotional responses. Um, for example, colored pencils help people feel more in control versus paint tends to uh, make people feel more emotionally open. Does not always do have that effect on people, but um, so it's a combination of meeting people where they are and their individual characteristics and what we know about the materials. Have you ever heard about using an art journal for healing? Oh, absolutely. Um, art journals for healing can be used in all different kinds of ways. There are many people who have done their journey from diagnosis to treatments and keeping records, or you can just use it as a way to um, just enjoy yourself and document your daily life, your cup of coffee, and be present in the moment. Um, so there are lots of ways to do daily journals. So is art therapy mostly painting or, or drawing, or do you do any other activities or projects? Um, we could do all kinds of projects. So uh, people use all different materials from clay, collage, painting. Um, you could use found objects of things in your house that you wouldn't even think of. You could make an art piece out. Uh, we've done that, so. That's it. Okay, and I think we're close to being out of time. Thank you, Mira. I want to thank everyone that uh, presented today. We are so fortunate to live uh, <clears throat> in a place where we have the University of Cincinnati Health, uh, the Gardner Center uh, that, uh, that UC Health provides, um, and an opportunity to learn about ways that we can take control of our wellness. And I think we got, uh, we had some excellent representations today. There are more, there are other aspects of uh, integrative medicine that uh, you can explore. I think uh, what uh, Dr. Golovic 
mentioned earlier, try something, pick something, uh, whether it's that, that menu item, that recipe uh, once in a while. Uh, I have a good friend who is a yogi, and he's always told me when I complain that I'm not getting as much as I probably should out of yoga, he always tells me it's not yoga perfect, it's yoga practice. And then he tells me to get back to practice. <clears throat> we also want to thank the Manor House. We hope that uh, next year uh, you'll be able to come and join us here once again. Uh, they do a wonderful job for us, and we really appreciate it. The folks uh, from Prestige Audio Video and Creative Services for the job they've done in bringing this to you today. Uh, I'll do a little bit of a commercial for Parkinson Support and Wellness. Uh, you'll be able to uh, go on our website at parkinsoncincinnati.org to find the full recording and individual uh, recordings of each of today's presentations. You can also find there the list of our upcoming educational seminars that we do on a monthly basis, typically the third Saturday of the month. We're still in a virtual world, uh, but again, we look forward to bringing those to you live and in person in the coming days. At our website, you'll also be able to see, uh, in, in addition to the upcoming educational events, there is a spot where you can find exercise and other therapies, uh, a matrix that we have that uh, allows you to look up either by neighborhood or day of the week, uh, where providers are uh, and uh, contact information for each of those. If you're looking for a support group, we have a similar matrix on the website under sharing. So, uh, and, and it is done the same way, uh, day of the week and by neighborhood. And then finally, uh, I'm happy to announce that Steady Strides, our annual uh, 5K walk run, that is our primary uh, source of funding for Parkinson's Support and Wellness, will be held again uh, in October. It's Saturday, October the 1st, uh, and is at the Lindner Family Tennis Center again. Uh, we were able to do it live and in person last year. Uh, we will be able to do it live and in person again this year. You can go to our, again, to our website, look for Steady Strides, and there'll be uh, instructions on how to register, how to start a team, uh, how to get involved in this communal event that is so much more than just a fundraiser, so much more than uh, just a walk, but an opportunity for those of us in the Parkinson's community to come together and share as we choose to find wellness in our life. With that, thank you very much. Have a great weekend. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at Steady Strides. We look forward to seeing you here next year. Thanks very much.